Ezekiel chapter 37, the famous chapter about the dry bones. Let me read you just a couple of verses, starting at verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And then verse 12, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and I will cause you to come up from your graves and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you will know that I, I the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. I will open your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. I, the awesome, almighty I am. He says, I will open your graves. And the simple bottom line is that only awesome God can open our graves. And then he says, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. In other words, God is saying to us, if my spirit is not in you, whether you want to believe it or not, you do not live. You might have all sorts of different de definitions about what life is. It might be uh, involved with riches. It's involved with all those other things. But you need to hear me, says the Lord, that if my spirit is not in you, irrespective of the way you look at it or define it, you do not live. As simple as that. Sure. 1 John 5, 12 says, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. Now, you can't be more emphatic and categoric than that. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. Again, the same thing. If you are not born again, truly born again, if Jesus Christ is not Lord of your life, whether you want to believe it or not, you do not have life. Please tell them that if Jesus is not Lord of your life, you don't have life because God says so. John 5, 24 to 27, it says, As I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. So I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word, and that's the way it works, you hear it and you believe it, and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. Now, this is the important part. He has crossed over from death to life. Now, we all know about life being born and then dying. So it's life to death. But he's saying here, it's death to life. 
It's death to life. When you get born again, you come from death to life. So you come from death to life. Now that is profound and it's huge because it defines everything around us. And it makes that issue the most important issue of our life. As in Adam, we all die, a double L. And so in Christ, we will all be made alive. Now you see it all started in the Garden of Eden when God made man and he was very pleased with what he made. Mind, body and spirit, very pleased it tells us He's very pleased with what he made. Mind, body, and spirit. The spirit, the mind, the body, and the spirit. The spirit is the important part because the spirit was the image of God in us. The spirit separated us from all other creations. We were a higher creation. We had the spirit in us. And the spirit was our means of communication with God. Mind, body, and spirit. God made us for his pleasure. So he made man and then gave man an additional issue. He gave man his own will to decide even about him. So he handed us over to our own will. And obviously, there was a need to test that will. So he said, well, yeah, in the Garden of Eden, I make one stipulation. Don't go near that tree and eat the, eat the fruit. So Adam said, what happens if we do? And God, who doesn't lie, he said, you will surely die. You will die. If you eat of that fruit, you will die. And you better pass that on to Eve, because when he spoke to Adam, Eve wasn't around. So he obviously is a dutiful husband. He did that. And we know, Daniel, you do not eat of that fruit. Anyway, one day, Eve was walking around the Garden of Eden, and she was admiring everything that God had made for and the devil. The devil intervened and, 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 and said, sure, God has really given you everything. He's given you dominion. He's given you everything. Yeah. But I notice one thing, that you and Adam don't go near that tree and eat the fruit. Why? So she said, well, God told Adam that we will die. He said, oh, nonsense. You won't die. He said that fruit, not only is that fruit nice to taste, but it will give you wisdom. You will be like God. You will know the difference between good and evil. You will be like God. You will not die. And we know the story. There it is. God said you will die. The devil said, surely not. Surely not. And we know the story. She was tempted, she and Adam, and they did die. They didn't die in the mind and they didn't die in the body. But they died spiritually. And all God was underlining was that there is only one death of any consequence. And that is when you die spiritually. Passing away of the body isn't the issue. When you die spiritually. Because when you die spiritually, you are separated from God. It's the only real death. And it makes sense if God is the almighty God that he is. Surely he has made it impossible for man to live or find peace or anything any other way than his way. It's through him. So they did die. God was underlining there is only one death of any consequence, and that is the spiritual death. And so they died spiritually. Now, if you wanted to find out whether I was alive, you would probably have to get two doctors. One, let's say a physician, and the other one may be a psychiatrist, because if you've been involved in South African cricket for 10 years, you definitely need to see a psychiatrist. So anyway, both those two. But the bottom line of those two guys is that they both represent man's incredible advancement in science, in medicine, and all those things. I mean, thinking themselves so wise, we became fools. So we are so clever. And if anyone represents uh, our, our gains and our advancements, it is those two guys, the physician and, let's say, the psychiatrist. They're busy analyzing our minds. Anyway, 
hopefully those two guys, if they had a look at me, they would declare me sane and alive, hopefully. Okay. Now, if we had taken those two experts into the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve had eaten of the fruit, and we said to the two experts, tell us, are they alive? And he said, yes, of course they are. They are alive. But God says they did. And that's been the problem ever since then. Ever since then, and we don't want to get ourselves involved in that. That is the problem. We died spiritually. We don't want to make this a big issue. We want to make it something small. It's a very simple issue, and it's a straight. You see, when they ate of the fruit, man died spiritually. He became mortal, subject to death. He became Adamic, mind, body, and dead spirit. He became dead and sinful. He incurred the wrath of God, and he incurred and lost God's image, the image of God. God is spirit, and it's the spirit in us that was the image of God. So what actually happened there was that life, in fact, became what are best termed uh, like a funeral march. Because thanks to Adam and Eve, we're all born dead spiritually, meaning separated from God. And unless we do something about it, yeah, we die spiritually. So you're born dead and you die dead. So that's a funeral march in my estimation. Born dead and you die dead. I mean, we're all then born with a one-way ticket to the grave. If someone says to you, or someone says to me, how do you get to hell? I say, very easy. You just keep walking. You just keep walking. You see, you're born dead spiritually and you die dead. You're born dead. You're born separated from God. And unless you do something about it, you will stay in that position and the devil will do his best to encourage you to stay there. Psalm 23 tells us, though, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's where we walk all the time. And for that reason, in the valley of the dry bones. And then we know the gospel. That's what man did. We did. We incurred the wrath of God. We got ourselves into trouble. And so God had a plan. And the true gospel is that he sent his son. His son paid the price, paid the price for our sin and restored the spiritual link to the father only in the son. He reopens that link. In fact, it actually underlines for us that Jesus is life. Jesus is life. And if life is a funeral march, he's the only one who stops that funeral march. Jesus stops the funeral. He's the only rescuer. And almost as if to confirm that, if you look in the Bible, you will see, perhaps there were more of them, but you will see that the Bible mentions three occasions when Jesus attended funerals. Very interesting. Number one, Jairus' daughter in Matthew 9 and Mark 5. The daughter was dead and they asked Jesus to come. The professional mourners had gathered and they were weeping and chanting and, and, and mourning and, and making the, the usual commotion. They were having, dare I say it, a good funeral. Wailing more out of a custom and job than genuine sorrow. But Jesus arrives and he pronounces that the girl's not dead. The wailing turns to mocking and scorning and laughing and unbelief. And what did Jesus do? He put the mockers out and he raised the dead girl. Funeral number one, Jesus arrives, no death. So, number two, the widow of Nain in Luke 7. On the outskirts of the village, Jesus' followers met up with a funeral procession. The dead were always carried out of the village beyond the city walls. Four men were carrying the beer. B-I-E-R, not B-E-E-R. Perhaps the, the, the beers they had later, but it was a B-I-E-R. And there was a crying widow. She had lost her husband, and now she had lost her son. Jesus stopped the procession and raised the dead boy. Funeral number two, Jesus arrives, no death. Sure. Funeral number three, Lazarus in John 11. Now, he had been dead for four days just to make sure, as it were. He wasn't in a hurry to get there. Anyway, finally, he gets there, and he says, roll away the stone. And then he speaks, and he says, Lazarus, 
come forth. And he did remove the grave clothes and let him go. Remove the grave clothes and let him go. Funeral number three, Jesus arrives. No death. Jesus had raised one who had just died, one on the way to the burial, and one who had been buried for four days. Now there is a simple bottom one-liner in this, and that is that death becomes life in Jesus Christ, and only in Jesus Christ. There's no other way. It's only in Jesus Christ, because God ordained so, it's only in Jesus that death becomes life. Only Jesus reverses God's promise to Adam and Eve that you will surely die, because only Jesus is God. Only Jesus is God. It's as simple as that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody, nobody, nobody comes to the Father except through me. And that brought into play the greatest sin of all. The greatest sin of all is to reject that. The greatest sin of all. It is the Father of all sins. Unbelief. It's an absolute, it's the original sin. It's the Father of all sins is not to believe that simple issue. There is only one way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody, nobody. And church preach it. We're not talking about religion or Christianity or anything. We're talking about Jesus Christ and life. He who has the Son has life. Because Jesus earned life. Jesus brings life. And Jesus is life. I mean, with Lazarus, he had to be specific. He said, Lazarus, come forth. If he had just said, come forth, all the dead would have raised. Then you can smile. But it tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 6, that at Christ's return, there will be a shout, come forth, and the dead and the alive will rise, taken away, raptured, whatever. Many will be left behind, sitting in the churches. Everybody in heaven is there thanks to Jesus. Yes, Old Testament too. We know that in the Old Testament when people died, they went to the, 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 the resting place. Abram's bosom, paradise, or, 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 or uh, Gehenna. Seol Hades is a resting place. And there was a good spot, which was Abram's bosom and paradise. And there was a bad spot, Gehenna. The bad news about the bad spot was that it could see the good spot. So that spoiled the view. And the good news about the good spot was that they couldn't see the bad side because that would have been a bad view. So there we have it, as simple as that. Abraham, Abraham saw my day and was pleased when Jesus died on the cross. He said, I'm going down to paradise. You will be with me in paradise. I'm going there to collect Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're waiting for me. It's the fulfillment of the covenant. As simple as that. It's Jesus. Jesus is the only one. He is the only savior. Because God ordained that. God ordained it. And it's not difficult to understand. I mean, the interesting thing is that when Jesus rose from the dead, they accused the, the the disciples are being grave robbers, but there is only one grave robber, and his name is Jesus. Only Jesus robs the grave. He has an analogy. You go down to the, the furniture shop, and you buy yourself a nice lamp, one of those big lamps for the lounge. Lamp with a big stand, with a nice uh, shade, and obviously a bulb. You buy that uh, contraption, you take it home, and you put it in pride of place in the lounge so that people will notice it. If they don't notice it, you nudge them that way. But now what is the most important part of that contraption? The plug. Because that thing is useless, however much you pay for it, unless it's got a plug 
and it's plugged in. Okay, we all know that. So God made Adam and Eve, and they were two beautiful lampstands, stand, shade, bulb, and they were both plugged in. You know, Adam and Eve were married, and they didn't even fight. Can you believe it? Why was that? Because they were plugged in. They were plugged in. When people uh, come to me uh, these days and they say, you know, we just help you with the, with the, the, the marriage. And think, I say, you know, there's a bottom line with it. You need to be plugged in, both of you. Both need to be plugged in. It's as simple as that. Anyway, they were plugged in. And then we know what happened. They were tempted. And what did they do? They unplugged themselves. So they unplugged themselves and ended up in the lounge standing in the lounge, dead and unplugged. And the devil does his level best to convince you that it's okay to be a dead, unplugged lamp in the lounge. So you go to church week in and week out, and there you are. You're dead and, 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 and unplugged. But um, you, you sort of know there's something missing. And when you start querying it, the devil will throw a seminar and say, no, that's rebellion or whatever it is. They, you, you, they, and just stay there. So there you are. But you know that you know that something's missing. And then one day you make a discovery. Somebody tells you that you need a plug. Somebody tells you that you need a plug. So the devil goes into the plug business and he makes all sorts of different plugs. But there's only one plug that works and that's the Jesus plug. Hallelujah. You now find out that you need a plug, and the plug you need is the Jesus plug. Hallelujah, does your light come on? No, it doesn't. You see, you've got to go and get that plug. It's for free. But you've got to go and get it, and you've got to go and plug it in. And that's the great problem that we have. First of all, we don't preach that. And secondly, there's a cost involved. And we all know that there's a cost involved. But we don't get plugged in. We, we know, sort of know that we should. But we go to church and there we, every Sunday they preach about the plug and their tapes on the plug and their videos on the plug and we sing about the plug. And we even try and sit next to plugged in people hoping that they will influence us. But the bottom line is you have to be plugged you have to be plugged in, properly plugged in. You have to be born again. You have to truly have met the Lord Jesus Christ with fruit coming out of your life. You have to be born again. It's not an intellectual thing. It's not about teachings. It's not about all those things. It's about Jesus and Jesus. And it's not to do with all our best intended efforts. It has to do with Jesus and the preaching of the simple gospel about what is life. Life is Jesus. Life is Jesus. George, he used to come every Monday to our Bible study. Every Monday he came to our Bible study. And, you know, he'd been a Christian all his life. And he used to come to me and he used to say, So, sure, Peter, I really battled to believe. I want to believe. I know that I should believe, but I really battle to believe. If only God would reveal himself to me. He said that you had a wonderful experience, a sort of falling uh, experience. He said, if, if God had had this, given me the same thing, I would have no problem believing. If only, if only God would reveal himself. Anyway, he had been reading the Bible and he was one Monday night, he came there and he was quite excited because uh, he found a, a, an, an excerpt, I think it's in Ephesians, where it suggested that uh, there's, a, there's a, 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 a sort of Christian that qualifies just sneaking in, uh, singeing his pants on the way in. So he said, well, maybe that's him. Uh, he might just sneak in. But he was battling to believe, if only. Anyway, many years ago, he was uh, on, on a weekend up in the, the game reserve in South Africa, the northern end of the game reserve. And one Saturday, and Saturday night, he was there in the bungalow all on his own. And it was round about midnight and the lights went out, which they do quite often uh, in this country. And the lights went out. And at the same time as the lights went out, old George had a heart attack. 
a massive heart attack. But in the process of that heart attack, he cried out to the Lord. He survived. He got back to Durban and they did all the tests. And eventually, when they'd done all the tests, George sat across the desk from the physician. And the physician said to him, George, you have no right to be alive. He said, you had a heart attack, a massive heart attack. You have no right to be alive. But George will never be the same again. And it wasn't the physical heart attack that changed his life. There in that bungalow that night, George had a heart attack, spiritually speaking, about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He cried out to Jesus. And all of a sudden that night, the knowledge of Jesus Christ slipped from being just an intellectual thing in his head to being a condition of his heart. And he would never be the same again. We need, the church needs a heart attack about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You have to be born again, properly born again. And born again isn't just putting up your hand or filling in a form. Born again means meaning business with Jesus Christ. It means giving up your independent right to yourself. You have to do that. And it's not preached. And we wonder why. We've got all sorts of other intellectual answers. And we wonder why we're producing a whole lot of intellectual Christians. Who haven't been born again. Who know about him. But they don't know him. They know about him. But they don't know him. I want to give you a perspective. Mom and dad, I was born a long time ago. And uh, in, in Victorian, uh, my, my kids say we were uh, Victorian in our upbringing, but Queen Victoria died a, lo a long time before I, I was born. But anyway, I know what they're trying to say. But my mom and dad were, were strict. But you know, I love my mom and dad. But my brother and I, we never, ever cheeked mom and dad. Never. I would never have considered it. It wasn't par for the course. You couldn't do that. We just honored them. Love your mother, honor your, your parents, that it may go well with you. We didn't do it for biblical reasons, but it was part of the deal. It was just part of it. I know that if I cheeked my mom, I'd have got into a lot of trouble with my dad. It, we didn't even think about it. It wasn't on the cards. It wasn't allowable. It wasn't available. Went to a fancy school. It was like a Christian school. Uh, the Grey High School in, in, in Port Elizabeth. It's, uh, uh, you know, fancy schools have Latin mottos. So the Latin motto there was try a jump to you there's three and one. I used to think it was rugby, cricket and athletics. But I later found out that that was mind and body and spirit. And maybe they did much for the mind and body, but uh, maybe I can sue them for what never happened there uh, spiritually. Because we said prayers and we sang hymns and we did all those things, but never even close. We played cricket in the days when it was amateur. So we didn't make any uh, money out of it. We had to do uh, other jobs. But the family is, 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 is known for cricket. So the cricket. Uh, cricket was my life. And my dream was to, first of all, be a springbok, go to England and beat England in England. And we did that in 1965. Five years later, by 1970, we were the best cricket side in the world. We reckoned to be uh, one of the best cricket sides that, that ever uh, existed. Now, I don't know how they work that out, but we don't want to argue with them. If that's what they want to say, so be it. But I was at one stage the fastest bowler in the world. I was the ranked number one bowler in the world. Honorary life member of the MCC, all that stuff. I was chairman of selectors here in South Africa, all that stuff. Played squash and hockey and bowls interprovincially, interstate, as you would call it in Australia. I ran the Comrades Marathon, which is some 90 Ks from Durban to Peter Marisburg, six times just to prove 
my insanity. But, you know, I did all those things. And then I got into the business world because I started off in journalism and there wasn't enough money. So I got into the business world and, and I ended up CEO of a multi-million company. All those things. And when I look back at family and friends and all those things, if someone said to me, if you had your life again, what would you want over? What would you change? I'd say, no, I'm happy. I'll have the same again. Thank you. I don't know what I did to deserve that, but I'll have the same again. Now, here is the bottom line. That life, that whole life, paled into insignificance the day I met Jesus. And I want to tell you, that is what happens. If you've truly met Jesus, everything else pales into insignificance. If you're busy trying to convince a guy that he's been born again, he hasn't. When you have met Jesus, you have met the Son of God. It is the pearl of great price, and all else pales into insignificance by comparison. All else pales into insignificance. I can't believe I have a lot to do with, 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 with church leaders. I can't believe the number of leaders that would say to me, Peter, I'm really battling to put Jesus number one in my life. I say, you must be joking. If you're battling to put Jesus number one, I'm not talking about battling with things in life. They, 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 that's far for the horse. But if you're battling to put Jesus number one in your life, there's something missing here. There's something, it doesn't ring true. Because Jesus is the Christ. He is life. Nothing else compares with him. And when you have met him, nothing else can dissuade you any other way. Mother Teresa, she said, you'll never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus Christ is all you've got. There was the evangelist. He had a, a great meeting and they had a great altar call. And then they decided to pray for the sick and they wheeled this guy up in a wheelchair. And as he came forward, three guys pounced on him to pray for him. And they prayed and prayed and nothing happened. And they raised their voices and nothing happened. Then the guy in the wheelchair starts to cry. And as he starts to cry, the people praying for him, they thought they had offended him. So they stood back. And as they stood back, he looked at them and he said, no, no, you haven't offended me. He said, these are tears of joy. He said, I am so pleased that I haven't been healed out of this wheelchair because this wheelchair is the most priceless thing that I own. He said, you know why? Because if I hadn't ended up in this wheelchair, I would never have found the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't need my legs. I have found the Christ. So most of us want to be healed out of the wheelchair that maybe maybe just maybe we'll think about jesus maybe if it suits us so and then we wonder why we wonder why there's no conviction and no authority in the church in terms of what they're preaching really this is the truth it's not up for debate jesus christ is lord he is Lord of all. And when you declare that, it's like at Peter and at the day of Pentecost. He stood up there and he preached about Jesus. And the people were aghast. The Holy Spirit was present. And what happened? They were gobsmacked. They looked up and said, what must we do? And Peter gave them the only answer that the church has ever been entitled to give. And that was repent and be baptized. In the name of Jesus. That's all. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Because when you do that, repent means turn 180 degrees. And repentance means that you come to conviction about your own sin. You know, you don't just regard yourself as wretched because someone tells you. You regard yourself as wretched because it's become a revelation to you. You are a wretch. You turn... And baptized means you die to self. And then you'll never be the same again. Never. And it is a matter of life and death. 
This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses. Now I place before you, says Almighty God, life and death. And he says there, now choose life. Now what part of that do we battle to understand? What part of that? We must meet Jesus individually, intimately, personally, spirit to spirit. It's huge. It's massive. It's a decision of the will. And it works. Lives are changed. Lives will never be the same again. For me, that has been the, 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 the greatest issue of serving the Lord for 40 years. To see lives changed. To see lives changed by the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. He changes them. It's not a fancy teaching. It's not a fancy book. It's not 10 ways or 20 ways. It's Jesus Christ. You must be born again, Nicodemus. Flesh gives birth to flesh. You know, we're all born once, thanks to Ma. Mind, body, and dead spirit, we're all born again. When we acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Lord and we add the spirit to the mind and body and we start here on earth, our journey into eternity with Almighty God. The gospel, when it's properly preached, demands a verdict because when it's properly preached if you don't say yes to it whether you want to believe it or not you have automatically said no you've said no it's as simple as that jesus said i am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me though he die yet he shall live and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he says, do you believe this? Do you believe this? And believe is actually a very strong word. It's a very strong word. It's, it's, it means believing and obeying on an ongoing basis. If you believe in me, you will do as I say. If you love me, you will do as I say on an ongoing basis. Not just one instant. It is something. And you will never be the same again. And that is the gospel. He who has the son has life. He who doesn't have the son does not have life. And it doesn't need a whole lot of analysis. It doesn't need some clever presentation. It just needs to be spoken with authority and conviction. And the church needs to stand up for this truth. What is life? I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me.